Today, I'll be speaking with Jacob Morrison. He is the co-host of the Valley Labor Reports, which can be found on YouTube, and it's Alabama's only union talk radio show. He's also the secretary treasurer of his regional AFL-CIO chapter. How are you today, Jacob? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Fantastic. So I was just wondering if you could just provide some background, like what got you involved in the labor movements? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I started uh, being, uh, you know, I, I'm from Alabama, right? You mentioned that. And I'm from a uh, rural um, Christian conservative family, right? So I grew up, um, you know, thinking that I would vote Republican whenever I ended up voting. And in 2016, I, you know, I knew that um, I was going to vote, but I knew, I also knew I wasn't super um, knowledgeable and and uh, so I started trying to do some research and, and as you can imagine, like I kind of moved left as I learned more, I ended up voting, voting for Bernie Sanders. I ended up getting really involved in the, uh, in democratic politics here in Alabama. <clears throat> and uh, like I was in leadership of my colleges, uh, college Democrats and the statewide college Democrats in Alabama, and um, I ran for the state Democratic Executive Committee. I was asked to be on my county executive committee. Um, I knocked on probably a thousand doors, made probably a thousand phone calls, and I know so many other people across the state who did the same thing, and uh, Democrats lost 72 seats in Alabama in 2018, and so I was like, you know, um, I was never particularly attached to the Democratic Party, so I wanted to do something that would um, that I felt would help people more. Um, I still vote Democrat, you know, as most as most union folks do, but um, I'm more. I want to do things that will more immediately and uh, in a in a greater way impact people's lives. And um, I started reading about the labor movement and what unions can do for folks. And it just really spoke out to me because even when I was deep in democratic party politics, it did strike me, you know, how kind of disempowering what we were doing was right. Like I was going and knocking on strangers doors, uh, asking them to vote for a person that uh, they nor I had ever met <laughs> and mm -hmm. hoping that they win and hoping that if they win, they don't betray them like every other politician has in their lifetime. Whereas when I go to people and talk to them about joining the union or starting a union in their workplace or strengthening an already existing union in their workplace, I'm not asking them to wait for an election. I'm not asking them to put their trust in a politician. I'm asking them to trust themselves and their fellow workers uh, and uh, they can make their lives better and they can make the lives of their sisters and brothers better. And I, I, I can point to a track record of unions having done this throughout the history of the labor movement. So it just seems more concrete, more immediate and more impactful than, um, than you know, electoral politics. Mm -hmm. Right. No, absolutely. And the thing is, I've done a lot of canvassing work myself. In fact, in 2016, I canvassed for my local Democratic Party. And what I noticed is voters were more receptive whenever I would talk about a specific ballot initiative or if I was talking about a local or even state candidate. When it came to national politics, that's where a lot of them lost interest. And that shows the disconnection there. And I also think, though, that one of the reasons why a place such as Alabama gets dubbed as conservative is because there's a focus on the cultural divide. So on culture wars that manifests itself through like MSNBC, Fox News, CNN. But when you talk about actual issues that even voters who might support the Republican Party, supposedly, they become more receptive to your cause and what you're saying. And towards movements that actually have material benefits for them. So on this note, because there is a divide among the left right now where some people are saying, look, organizing is all that matters right now. The Democratic Party has abandoned us. And then others would say, well, we need to have an inside outside game where we need to have the organizing, we need to have the direct action, but we still need to have politicians that are sympathetic to our causes even if it's not someone like Bernie Sanders, right? Even <clears throat> Joe Biden, better than Donald Trump when it comes to 
labor issues. And where do you see the connection between electoralism and organizing? And are they in competition with each other or do they have to harmonize moving forward? Um, yeah, before I answer that, I want to touch on what you were talking about with the kind of uh, class politics versus the cultural politics, because that's a very, um, that is extremely true. Like I said, I grew up in a rural, cultural, conservative family and community, and um, I believe I'm the only person from the church that I went to and the church that um, uh, and a bunch of churches that I knew of in my community. I think I'm probably the only person that is at least out and voting for Democrat, like right, like out out of the closet, so to speak. But when you talk to folks about these issues, I, I one person specifically, I was talking to them in 2016 about Bernie Sanders' platform. And I could get them to nod and agree and say, yes, it would be good if this happened for literally every single economic position that Bernie Sanders took. But he supported the right of women to choose to have an abortion and he supported gay marriage. And so that was like, that was it to them. Uh, and there was no other, there wasn't any other thing, anything else that you could say to that. And that is the, um, that is the strategy, right? The, uh, the talk radio station that I'm on is the largest in our area. It's where Sean Hannity came up on. Uh, there's a very strong, um, uh, a very influential talk show host on in the mornings. And um, if you listen to him, you listen to Rush Limbaugh, you listen to Mark Levin, Ben Shapiro, all these folks that are on this station, that's what they talk about mostly. They want to shy away from Healthcare. They want to shy away from wages. They want to shy away from these things that actually impact people's pocketbooks because they know that they're going to lose there. Um, but the question was, where do I see organizing and electoral politics? And, you know, obviously I've kind of made my decision. I'm going to spend my time organizing, but I don't, um, I'm going to vote for Democrats. I'm, you know, I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to go out and vote for a Republican. Uh, but I'm also in, unless it's a, uh, politician that I uh, really align with, like a Bernie Sanders type candidate, then I'm um, I'm not gonna like spend my time doing that. You know, like um, Noam Chomsky has a quote that says uh, he, he he said something like this recently that that politics is the day to day work of organizing, and every four years there's this big spectacle called a presidential election and you take 10 to 15 minutes out of your day and you vote for the lesser evil and then you go back to doing politics and so that makes sense to me um i'm not going to i'm not going to begrudge people that choose to spend more of their time in electoral politics in fact i think that i think that it's probably important uh, like in alabama um you know like i said we lost 70 seats in 20, in, in 2018 but as recently as 2010, both of our state houses were run by Democrats. And as recently as 2004, uh, we had, I believe, early 2000s, we had a Democratic governor. So um, there are, and, and you know, of course, a lot of these folks were blue dogs and, and um, they were voted out uh, after, a, after a black man was elected to the, what was the standard bearer for the Democratic Party. Um, so I'm not saying that in 2010, we had a progressive uh, state <laughs> legislature by any means, but, um, you know, I think there's work to be done in building up a party apparatus and making it, it it's an entity that can field strong candidates against Republicans, but, um, I think when you organize, you do both at the same time. You directly and you immediately impact people's lives. You put more money in their pockets, you get them better health care. And you also have these opportunities to talk to people. Like if you're just somebody's coworker, um, you don't really have a whole lot of like, ex or you don't have as much extracurricular conversation. But if you're in a union, especially a powerful union, you're having to have these difficult, intimate conversations about pay, health care, whether, whether to strike or not. And you're having to have these conversations often. And so you get to know your coworkers better and you socialize with them more. And studies have shown that um, union folks, uh, it, comparatively, you know, to similar non-union folks, 
uh, you know, union folks compared to similarly situated non-union folks. They vote more democratic and they're also less racist um, because they have more um, socialization and more intimate socialization with these people that um, have different opinions than them. And I've got it. We we did a couple interviews uh, on that specifically. We interviewed two nurses from a union hospital in Pennsylvania. One was a liberal, one was a conservative, and they were both talking about how great the union was. And the conservative even made a remark like, I didn't even know that liberals were human before, but I love, you know, his name was Joe. And he was like, Bill's my brother now, you know, this ultra liberal cuck whatever like this guy is my brother and i will go to the mat for this man any day of the week right that's powerful and i spoke to a uh, university of washington uh, uh professor on the program about a recent study that that he came out with that showed that showed that union membership made people less racist um because they have this increased and in, in intimate interaction with folks um through their union membership so you know and, and so it's not even like an either or thing. It's like when you organize, you um, when you organize in your workplace, you help them immediately, but you also build the foundation upon which um, good electoral politics can happen. No, that's absolutely true, and that's super important because there have been elements of the left right now that talk a lot about class reductionism, and essentially what that boils down to is individuals who are saying, "Look." Since you focus so much on class, then you're ignoring the issues of race and sexism, homophobia, et cetera. And I think you outlined how we can combat that. Because an argument that I've always made is if you were to implement Bernie Sanders platforms, so Medicare for all, Green New Deal, expansion of Social Security, minimum wage increase, et cetera, et cetera, you would see the biggest redistribution of wealth in this country's history, but specifically across races, because over time, that would be the result since individuals who are usually in minority groups are disproportionately impoverished and disadvantaged at large. So I think that's an important argument. But what you hit on is also super important because having unions, so essentially being part of an organization where your well being is dependent on another individual's well being and you all need to look out for each other against a common enemy, which would be management, right? I think that does a lot more to cultivate solidarity than what we're seeing right now with the rise of, for example, white fragility by Robin D'Angelo, where there's this idea of the way we combat racism is we tell people that they're racist and they, that can't change. And we then transferred this discussion over to HR departments and HR departments, they ultimately look, they work for management. And I think that this creates this dynamic now where it's because we're in a country with at will employment. So if someone is perceived as potentially saying something offensive under that standard, then you could fire them and then their entire livelihood is now evaporated. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, and the whole class politics versus identity politics thing is, um, I mean, the people who coined the term identity politics would be, uh, a lot of these folks would say that they're class reductionists now. You know, if you read like the Kambahi River Collective, um, Kiyanga Yamada Taylor, um, these, uh, I, 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 I I'm forgetting her name, but she was part of the Kambahi uh, River Collective. She was the woman, the black woman, who coined the term identity politics. And she's like, these people who are using this word have no idea what this word means. <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, you know, they're, they're um, essentializing based on, uh, on race, or, or, you know, in some cases they, they can be doing that, and they're totally forgetting class. And um, whereas class is, is, very important uh, in the construction of a person's identity and their placement in the social hierarchy. And uh, Jane McAlevey's books, she talks about this, um, you know, th this kind of drive on the left to have like a purity culture. And, um, you know, and she's like, when you're organizing, like you can't, 
you, you, just, you just literally can't do that because you need a super majority to be able to execute a good strike. And so like, if you've got somebody, even with like really problematic views on race or gender or whatever, um, you have to have enough solidarity and enough respect uh, for this person as a human being uh, for them to be able to go on strike and put their livelihood on the line. Like my co-host, David, uh, he has, um, I believe he has lost a house on the picket line before because the strike lasted so long. Like you're not just going to do that for anybody, right? But he is the president of a machinist union local in rural right to work at will Alabama and he has a 93% union density rate. These people do not have to pay dues to the union. 93% of them do, and most of the workers there are conservative white folks, right? And he is, a, he is somebody who is so far left, he wore an Antifa shirt uh, for his bargaining committee picture that was circulated in the international newsletter, right? And these people still voted for him to be president because they know that he will go to the mat for every single one of them, and it doesn't matter what their politics are. It doesn't matter who they're voting for in November, because he is on their side fundamentally as workers, as humans. And if we can't have that deep, um, you, you, you know, like a, a Christian love almost for our brothers and sisters on the shop floor, we're never going to be able to uh, fight the boss. We're never going to be able to fight the elite who are ruining this country. And uh, we're never going to be able to fight racism or fight classism or fight sexism on a real uh, large systemic level. Right. No, absolutely. So I think a lot of people, because obviously unions have been decimated in this country, unfortunately, especially since the 1980s. So I feel like a lot of people just aren't that familiar with the internal dynamics of unions. And honestly, a lot of the institutional obstacles they have to face. So I remember back in, like during Obama's first term, there were talks of potentially instating um, hard check, for example, which would have been a boon to unions. And, you know, unfortunately it wasn't a big priority for the Obama administration. But I was just wondering if you could just discuss why right now it's so difficult to start a union in the United States, specifically the National Labor Relations Board and that entire bureaucracy. Yeah, well, that's really, I mean, it's so unfortunate about Obama and, you know, card check, there, you, you can have a debate about whether or not that's the best thing to do, but, um, you know, uh, Democrats are they're so bad at politics. Anytime a Republican gets into office, they do things to um, make their placement in their office um, easier to attain again. Um, Scott Walker in Wisconsin, as soon as he, as he got into power, uh, he started destroying unions. Um, and uh, Obama, if, if he were better at politics, he would have done more to strengthen unions. But um, like he did with um, his organization, uh, Organizing for America, when he disbanded that and he instructed people to um, not, don't, he instructed donors not to donate to that, but to donate to the DNC where he had more control. You know, um, these politicians, they don't want outside bases of power pressuring them. Um, they want to be, be kind of the king technocrat who can do kind of whatever he wants. Um, and, and so that, that's really unfortunate uh, that they're not better at, at um, maintaining power. But, um, uh, why is it, was the question, why is it so hard? Or was the question, um, uh, explain the dynamics of a, you so know, also, kind of well, sidetracked? Uh, yeah, so also just explain, you know, why it's so hard to start a union. So, um, why is it so hard to start a union? Uh, you know, I mean, the, the bureaucracy, um, the NLRA, the NLRB has been gutted. Um, the, the National Labor Relations Board has a majority of Trump appointees. Um, he won't appoint, the, like you're supposed to have, I believe, three from the governing party and 
two from the minority party, but he won't appoint any Democrats to it. So it's all Republicans or it's like three to one Republicans on the board. Um, and so it's really favorable to management right now. But, um, but really the biggest, um, the biggest problem that I see with folks, it, because uh, a, lot of, a lot of times you don't even get to the board because you've got to file for an election before the board, before, you know, the boss can, can try some shady stuff with the board. Uh, but you have to get the workers to want uh, the union enough to fight for it. And folks are just so job scared and they have been for a long time. There's a chicken plant uh, to the south of me um, and, uh, and, and, this woman, her boyfriend worked at the chicken plant and somebody died uh, because the, uh, the chicken plant did not ha was not taking proper safety precautions. Um, and so somebody died and, and this woman, her boyfriend worked there and she reached out to me um, asking me to help him form a union at his workplace. And I was like, yeah, well, let's, that's dope. Let's do it. I will absolutely help him. I'll do everything I can for him. And um, he wouldn't talk to me because he was scared he was going to lose his job. Like, you know, <laughs> it's like, I can't, I can't do anything for you, man, if you're not even willing to talk to me. Um, but uh, folks are just so, and, and like this man had just watched somebody die at his job. And he's like worried he's going to, you know, um, I, there was another person that worked at a bar in town that they were talking to me about, um, about uh, uh, unionizing and, and they were like, um, you know, I'm really worried about retaliation and stuff. And, and, and this person just literally two minutes before uh, they told me that they were scared of retaliation, they told me that um, the best brewer in the restaurant was just fired because of personality conflicts with management. No uh, performance issues. They were never late. The beer that they made was always great. They just didn't get along with management and management fired them. And I'm like, you know, look, like, yeah, there are going to be risks with organizing, but the real risk is in not organizing because we're in an at-will state. Like, you can just be fired for whatever the hell. Like, it doesn't, they can fire you for any, anything that they want to fire you for. The, the way to protect yourself is to organize and to get a contract with a just firing, a just, claw, a just cause clause in the contract uh, to, to make sure that there has to be a, a due process before you can be kicked out on the street. Um, so, you know, more than, honestly, more than the bureaucracy and the unfavorable board that we have right now is uh, people are just scared, I think. I think people are just scared and, and um, you know, they haven't, like you mentioned, unions have been diminished, so it's not in the popular culture as much, so they don't have as much of a, um, you know, we're not in the public consciousness as much. They don't know anything about unions, really. Um, so uh, it's ignorance and fear, I think. And, and I mean, ignorance in like the value neutral, like they just don't know. Um, it, it, like somebody, uh, somebody reached out to our page thinking that we were like a political party. And I'm like, no, we're <laughs> like, we're, we're a union. And, mm -hmm. and they were like, what's a union? And I literally had to explain, mm -hmm. you know, what a union is and what it does. And they just had no idea. So it's ignorance and fear, I think, is the, is, are the biggest things that are standing in the way of, of unionization. And that's why, you know, we wanted to uh, have this show and have it on a conservative station because this is where a lot of folks in the area get news and um, they don't know, they don't know anything about unions. And if they've ever heard the word union, it's been in the context of uh, bad things being said about unions. So, mm -hmm. right now that's absolutely true. And that's why just strategically, I liked what Bernie's campaign initially did. I honestly wanted them to do more of this, but when they portrayed his campaign and his potential presidency, as an extension of FDRs, because FDR, in general, very popular president, even if someone doesn't know a lot about politics, they usually have a positive association with FDRs. I think that's good. And I also think, though, that going back, like you bring up FDR and how Bernie's like an extension of FDR, 
going back to that era, just discussing how, look, this is an incredibly American concept because when unionization was strong in this country, we had higher wages, more labor equality, better workplace protections, and just more social mobility. And social mobility is something that a lot of people care about, right? So I think that's a good way to connect with people. I also think, though, to a lesser extent, but I also liked how Bernie would show other countries as an example of, hey, this is actually happening right now. So for example, bringing up how in Germany, they have co-determination where corporate boards, 40% of them have to be comprised of labor representatives. And as a result, guess what? Higher wages, better workplace protections than us. And because I think that an issue that we have in the United States, especially with the oversaturation of corporate media is honestly not being that aware of what's happening outside of our borders. So I think once people start realizing, oh, wait, this is actually happening right now. And supposedly we're supposed to be the greatest country on earth. And yet we have a lower living standard than Germany. We have a lower living standard than Scandinavian countries. What, what, what are we doing? And so I think that strategically that could be a smart thing to do moving forward. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I'm a, a big fan of uh, FDR. Um, and uh, I think Harvey JK has uh, done a lot of work uh, trying to revive the legacy of FDR um, and kind of the radical politics of that era. And, um, and, and you know, uh, the reason that FDR was able to do that is because there was a large and militant labor movement at that time. I mean, never in the country's history has there been a more organized uh, coalition of, of working class organizations and all headed by um, socialists and communists and anarchists. Um, you know, I, and, and I think that, um, and I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, it's difficult to, to say exactly the, you know, there, there are a myriad of factors, but I can't help but believe that one of the reasons that unions declined so much uh, following the 50s, uh, following the Red Scare, is was because uh, the commies were kicked out of the AFL-CIO, as, as uh, uh, Phil Oates said in his song, you know, um, because uh, prior to the Red Scare, before people had to sign loyalty pledges and before the AFL-CIO made people swear that they were not communists or socialists or whatever, uh, you did, I mean, literally, if you looked at the leadership of most unions in the country, it was all led by uh, radicals, anti-capitalists. They had a, a strong class struggle um, view of things. And uh, so they were more powerful. And, you know, when you start going into the uh, management partnership stuff that the UAW did, uh, you know, obviously there are lots of other reasons for the decline of unions, but I believe that has to be one of them because you were like painting the bosses as partners in the struggle or whatever, partners in, in making your life better. And that's just not true. They want to scrape off as much money off of your labor as they can. And you as a worker want to keep as much of the money that you make as you can. And so like there's, there's like a fundamental struggle going on there, especially for bigger corporations. You know, you have an argument with a small business, you know, um, maybe, especially if you know the boss or they're your family or something, there's more of a partnership there. But like with these big corporations, Walmart, the Waltons, Bezos, Musk, they could not care less about you. And the way that they're, they treat their employees uh, show that. Um, and, and, you know, this kind of willy nilly milk toast unionism that had been prominent for the latter half of the 20th century just isn't speaking to workers because it's just not what they it's not what they see in their real life you know the, their boss isn't their friend and i think that most people intuitively know that yeah no, and i think that's kind of where we get this trope of the union boss who's actually friendly with management and they're just cutting backroom deals and so there isn't much input from the actual workers. And I think 
you know, honestly, once the Democratic Party especially started moving in that direction, then it became easier for Republicans to paint Democrats as corrupt, elite, and out of touch, and, oh, they just care about the union bosses because they donate to their political campaigns, and they don't care about working people. So I think, unfortunately, that accusation, that framing has also stuck. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and you know, the, the thing about union bosses is, you know, it, it did all of this, a lot of the corruption and stuff did come after the more ideologically committed folks were kicked out of the AFL-CIO, but also um, it originated as deals that were made with uh, the bosses, with the, the management bosses, right? It, it, Chris Brooks for Labor Notes has some really good reporting on um, the decline of the UAW and how uh, the how management at the big three um, started to bribe the um, started to bribe the leadership of the union and how you know the union leadership is now looks like they're headed to jail for their corruption and the company where the <laughs> the company CEOs where the uh, corruption originated they're still off scot free and and like I'm not defending the leadership of the UAW, they should, I mean, rotten hell for all I care, right? You're, they're um, spending members dues on uh, things that are not related to um, the fight for better wages and working conditions for their workers. They allowed themselves, uh, they, they kowtowed management uh, through, through members under the bus. And there's a growing uh, movement for democratic reform in the UAW. And so that's great. And I think that, um, the leaders who were corrupt in the UAW should absolutely be punished, but um, it's important to recognize where the corruption came from, and it came from management, and management has not been punished for it. No, absolutely, and that is a prominent theme throughout American politics, unfortunately, because, yeah, no, I, I think, though, that there has been a pretty big disconnect on the left and I am worried, and look, I mean, I'm a graduate student myself, and I'm not involved in any labor unions, but I, I've realized that over the last year, because over the last year I uh, took a gap year, right? So I did some community organizing, but I also worked in the service industry. And so I think that made me realize, wait a second, if labor is completely depoliticized, if it's not attached at all to any sort of left-wing politics, then we don't really have left-wing politics. And that's something important to uh, keep on, you know, to push moving forward. And so I was also wondering, I mean, this is more of an ideological question, and we might disagree on this, but I mean, it is what it is. But do you think that a strong, robust labor movement is possible under capitalism? Now, I mean, because the argument is, you know, that's the case right now in Germany. It's the case in the Nordic social democracies. It was also the case in the United States, arguably until the 1980s. Or is there eventually going to be, is management eventually going to, you know, claw away at whatever gains have been made? And we have to move beyond that. Um, it, I mean, you know, it's it's funny, the, the way that I talk about it, and I think it's good, um, you know, the way that I talk about socialists and, and more radical anti-capitalist types being in leadership of, of the unions. Um, you, you might would think that I'm a like a radical anti-capitalist type, but I'm, I'm actually really not. I consider myself uh, more of a social democrat just because mm -hmm. I'm not, um, you know, I don't, it's, it's difficult for me to... Uh, yeah, I mean, like Mark Fisher says, it's 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 easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. But I mean, genuinely, when I you know when I talk to anarchists and when I talk to communists and they and so they start talking about these moneyless and classless and stateless societies, I I my eyes just kind of glaze over, right? And um, I, I so my reverence for the anti-capitalist leadership of the unions of the first half of the 20th century is a reverence for the results that they got and maybe less so of the particular end goal that they had. Um, and, but, but I, again, you know, the results kind of speak for themselves. I think that you can have a strong and robust labor movement in a capitalist country. Um, uh, and I, I don't know that it's, it's, you know, I'm not 
convinced and I'm not unconvinced that it is necessary to move past the type of market economy. Uh, you know, of course, once workers have a strong and robust working class movement and we put in, it, we put in place um, good working class leaders, uh, then we need to put in reforms to cement the uh, to cement the power of the working class. We need to institute things like the right of first refusal so that workers in a company that is either going bankrupt or that they want to sell to another company, the workers should be able to have uh, the right to buy the company with a loan from the government. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn uh, proposed that in his run for uh, 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 for the prime ministership in the UK. And I think that that's something that's obvious and that would um, make workers more powerful. I think that you need to institute reforms that make it easier to form a union. I think that uh, you need to uh, put unions more at the at the center of the public conversation uh, so that people know more about them. I think that you need to make it harder for people to be fired for organizing. I think that you need to end at will employment. Uh, you know, so I, uh, like there are reforms that, you, but none of those none of those things is going to make us like a not capitalist economy, right? And so, you know, like I, I, it. it it's difficult for me to, and, and, you know, I think that we should incentivize worker ownership. I think that we should incentivize worker co-ops. I think that we should incentivize unions. Um, but, you know, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about like post-capitalist societies right. myself. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, personally, I'm on the same page as you. I also view myself as a social Democrat. And I think there is strong evidence that social democracies can still function as relatively equal societies. I mean, they still have their issues, but as far as the, they're like the most uh, substantiated uh, cases of, I'd say just prosperous countries that actually do look out for the rights and dignity and just economic well-being right. of their citizens. So I, I think we're- but, I, I mean, also, uh, I mean, also though, like, I'm not even sure, like, I no matter what your answer is to that question, I don't know how that would affect the way that we should, that I don't know that that would affect what we ought to do, right? Like, so a robust working class, a robust and powerful working class is impossible to maintain in a capitalist society. So like, what effect does that have on my organizing, right? right. Like, I've got to go out and organize anyway. And if we get to a place where we have a strong and robust um, working class that is capable of making big demands, then uh, let's talk about what those demands are when we get there. But like, we're not there yet. So regardless, <laughs> I mean, whether or not, yeah. whether or not yeah, we yeah. can sustain this in the capitalist oh, society, like we've got to, we've got to organize. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, you make a great point there. And I agree with that because I mean, cause I feel like there are a lot of, and it's not a lot of people, but a decent amount who I understand their frustrations on the left who may classify themselves as socialists or as anarchists who think that capitalism is inherently corrupt and we just can't really do anything. With it. And, it's, and my argument to them is, look, in order for us to get to a socialist utopia or anarchist utopia, we're going to have to go through social democracy first. That I truly believe. If if we take the other route of going further down fascism, then that goal becomes a lot harder because all of our political goals are no longer on the table. And I think just in general, another, because I think labor is super important when talking about power within a given country and specifically the influence of working people and left-wing movements. But I also think, you know, there has to be more of an emphasis on campaign finance as well. I mean, we need to have publicly financed elections. We need to also overturn Citizens United. And so making sure you have justices who are against those rulings in power, that's also super important. Because I think ultimately it comes down to making sure that we have labor power, but also that we take the money out of politics and then we can truly move forward and discuss and expand on these ideas and implement these ideas. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's, uh, I would agree with all that, yeah. Absolutely. So I was, uh, so today I've been speaking, you know, with Jacob Morrison, co-host of the Valley Labor Reports. You can check that out on YouTube. I'll include 
it in the description box below. So Jacob, thanks for uh, taking the time to speak with me today. Great discussion. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.